it's just a very interesting story to share with the viewers that actually just before he becomes prime minister, um, when he's sort of in his, his wilderness years before the India Act gets passed, uh, he actually does leave the country for the one and only time in his right. life. This yeah. is when his trip to France is. Mm. Um, and I'll, I'll be very brief about it, but he uh, goes with two of his friends from Cambridge. He goes with Wilbur Wilberf uh, William Wilberforce and with um, uh, Edward Elliot. Um, apparently he had a penchant for the illiterate names, you know, <laughs> as his friends. But um, he, um, they get to a sitting barn ready to cross the channel and obviously to Dover. And uh, they all sort of do that classic thing where, oh, and you've, you've brought the travel papers, haven't you? No, no, I thought you were doing it. You know, and all three of them find that they haven't got their the documents, their um, the letters of um, uh, of approval. So, sort of the the general idea was that if you're traveling to another country back then, you knew someone in that country who was going to vouch for your character, mm -hmm. almost like a reference, and you know, admit you were safe to to go there. And uh, they managed to get some uh, some of those documents from a friend um, for a, a gentleman living in Reims. And they get there and find that he's, uh, he's just a grocer <laughs> and he's got one room in the back. <laughs> and so they're all sort of huddled. You know, they've gone from Lincoln's Inn and all these great, you know, to just huddling in the back of this grocer's room <laughs> uh, for a few, a few weeks. And then um, word spreads in France that the son of the great Chatham is, is about. And before you know it, he's um, invited to the great, um, you know, estates of Fontainebleau. And he actually does get to meet Louis the Sixteenth, Marie Antoinette, and really? um, he, he very. I didn't know that. Yeah, he very briefly meets huh. the, the the French aristocracy, huh. which is very interesting because I think um, obviously, as you know, students of history will know, those people aren't going to be around much longer, and so you know, a bit like Burke, when Burke goes to France just sort of mm. before, and he says, "Well, mm. I met all these people mm. that you've just killed off," and. <laughs> Everything. So Pitt also got to do that. There was even talk of uh, a proposal uh, to marry Pitt to Jacques uh, Necker, you know, the finance minister's daughter, oh, right. which never happens. But oh. um, eventually he's brought back on the uh, urgent news of the India bill being put through. So there oh. we are. We've just caught up that little aspect of his life that's very interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. I knew Burke had gone across and met a lot of people. Mm. I didn't know Pitt had. That's surprising, because uh, uh, that's quite that's, uh, uh, that's a fairly important detail. It's the if only he time met, he goes abroad. If he met um, Louis XVI, mm. um, yeah, okay, wow, okay, that's interesting. Mm. It's always good to learn new things like that. Yeah, I have to slot that into my matrix of sort of knowledge about Pitt, <laughs> that that happened, try and remember that. That's a good mm. one. Um, so yeah, so when he starts before, so there's a period there in his um, in this sort of seventeen year period of being prime minister. Um, when he first gets in, and then the events of the French Revolution. So I suppose that's sort of the calm before the storm, would you say? Yeah, I think so. He's 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 very diligent. He he's um, he really enjoys finance. Um, I can't fathom how. I you know, <laughs> think it's stuffy and dry, and I can only think of the Monty Python sketch with the, the chartered accountant mm. who wants to be a lion tamer. But um, <laughs> I, I think that um, he, he's very meticulous about the numbers. And at the time when he becomes prime minister, um, he obviously, as Chancellor of the Exchequer as well, he mm. starts working on the budget. And uh, but before that, he obviously needs to win the general election so he can crush this opposition. And so starts the uh, the mad, riotous general election of um, 1784. Oh, and yeah. this results in all of the things that we'd spoken about, the public sentiment coming back onto his side. Um, but another thing that Pitt does, which um, is very important and integral to how he acts as a state statesman, is that we were obviously saying he's quite incorruptible and won't take a title for himself, but he just basically writes to the king and says, look, you need to unleash your power to create peerages. Mm -hmm. We need to get all the people who are opposing us, get them sent to the lords, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. I can do some more in the commons, buy them off with peerages, you know, mm -hmm. pay off this um, 
his wife, she's got enormous debts. Can you? Can we have two thousand pounds there to pay that off? So he'll come over pensions to my bank. For right, pensions, yeah. yeah. All these things, you know, the royal coffers are totally let loose, you know, because Pitt, although he's not interested in those things himself, he understands that that makes other men tick enormously, yeah. and he's willing to use those to to do whatever he needs to shore up his own majority in the House of Commons. One thing I think we have to say um, in that period before that election is that where he didn't have any sort of majority, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but Fox uh, tabled a um, uh, sort of vote of no confidence in him and won. And so, well, these days, if there's a vote, of, if there's even really going to be a vote of no confidence, you're already, your government's certainly going to fall. If one actually takes place and you lose, you're absolutely obliged to resign yeah. and call another general election. If you don't, then quite legitimately people say, well, you're a tyrant then. And so that's what happened. Like that, so anyway, today it just wouldn't happen. But then Fox, yeah, Fox causes vote of no confidence, wins it. And Pitt just refuses to resign. And it, get, it goes to the point where the king says, well, it's, it's, it's fine. The, the bottom, bottom line legally is that the king uh, can say, no, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to force you to resign. And I, I, so I'm not going to. But, so that's what happened, I believe. Yeah. But, so, but that is a constitutional crisis. Yes, it is. Um, but yeah, he's, um, one, he's the king's last resort. You know, keeping Fox and... Uh, I mean, I get why George III did that. Right. Because he's like, anything but Fox at any cost, whatever. Yes. We'll have a civil war before I allow that to happen. <laughs> I, I think, right? I think he'd have done it. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, um, but I suppose it's that thing as well that, you know, oh, we've tabled a vote of no confidence in you and we've won it. And Pitt's like, yeah, I know you have no confidence in me. Hmm. What do you think the past two months have been about? You know, with me not getting any legislation through. This is not new news, but that's okay. We're going to have the general election and I'm going to trounce you in it. Um, so oh, I just think that's crazily ballsy mm. for Pitt. Again, as a young man, perhaps, perhaps it was better that he was young, where you sort of you're sort of not scared sometimes when you're younger. I know it's the case. You get a bit more timid as you get older. That's why you know really old men are sometimes extremely scared, timid figures. And when you're young, really young, you're just you're just ballsy. He's not <laughs> you, as confined by the conventions of his time. Right. I mean, that is extremely brave to lose a vote of no confidence and go, yeah, mm. yeah what now? Mm. Yeah, I'm not going. <laughs> what now? What are you going to do? <laughs> right? That is, that's gutsy. It really, really is. Mm. Well, of course, he knew he had the king. It's, it's gutsy of both of George III and Pitt to do that because they could, or they very nearly were, or they were even staring down the barrel of, maybe you're going to get mobs now. Maybe there will be actual civil unrest, probably not on actual, some sort of civil war, but okay, you're playing with fire now, very, very real politically, but you're playing with fire now because your opponents legitimately can say you've got no right. They're not, they're not lying. No. There's a vote of no confidence in the Commons. What are you doing not resigning? So again, not only is he young and a genius, but he's got sort of a, a will of, of iron. Yeah, he does. So he's a remarkable person. Yeah. Uh, one anecdote to, to sort of um, demonstrate his um, appeal to the public. Um, I, forgive me, I can't quite remember chronologically where this slots in to the events, but I do think it is around the time of this election, is that he's um, being given the freedom of the city mm -hmm. by, by, of London. And uh, he goes out to his carriage and he's just swarmed by Pittites and followers from the general public who love what he's doing. And they, they uncouple the horses and uh, start pulling his carriage for him. And obviously that's very flattering, but all of a sudden you've no idea where they're taking you. And they end up going around to um, Pall Mall, to the Prince Regent. Oh, this Sorry. is after he wins the election, that election. Oh, is it? Yeah, I think yes. that's in the immediate wake of him winning the election, I think. Right. But, sorry, go on. Yeah. Oh, well, only to say that uh, Pall Mall, where the uh, Prince of Wales is, uh, is living, and they start... Um, Carlton House. Yeah, making some uh, 
gestures and uh, profanities at the uh, <laughs> and they, they then they go around to Fox's residence and Pitt has to stop them from smashing his windows. Um, they just the untrammeled mob. Mm. Just you know you can't. Um, it's only the respect for Pitt that actually gets him to to obviously stop that happening. And um, then they pull around uh, Brooks uh, Club, which is where the uh, the big wigs literally hang out yeah. and. Um, uh, a bunch of uh, foxites come out with uh, clubs made of uh, chair legs. And Pitt has to evacuate the carriage with his brother and be gotten to safety because these people are so outraged by him and what he's doing. And he eventually has to flee to the safety of White's uh, club. But that's the level of, you know, riotous, just anarchy that these sorts yeah. of election processes could create at the time. It's close. It's close to it. It was more brawl. Mm. It's very, very close to, if not really, the beginnings of some sort of mob rule. Uh, it's really interesting that thing about the gentlemen's clubs, Brooks and Whites. Um, they still exist. White certainly does. Mm. Um, yeah, and the different political factions, lots and lots of gambling. Uh, could go on and on and on about the, the gentlemen's clubs. Um, but uh, yeah, so Pitt very close to being beaten up maybe beaten to death who knows it could have it could have got nasty real quick history could right have changed there. that day right yeah <laughs> right. um so once again to say in comparison we're very civilized in the 21st century compared to that right we are i mean you wouldn't get a mob surrounding uh, uh golden brown or rishi sunak trying to beat him up with chair legs no we would you know <laughs> it's sort of crazy to think like that or or um sort of storming downing street and throwing bricks through number 10's window right uh yeah no, so no way it's a lot more cutthroat it really is um again some of the some of the paintings by hogarth give you a feeling sort of the general drunkenness mm. um that's one thing i'd like to say if um you know pitt was something of a, of a drunk three bottle a day man mm. um fox was a drunk not the first, not the last uh, senior politicians who are essentially functioning alcoholics. But drink in general was extremely pervasive. I mean, most water was quite dirty. So even in the 19th century, a lot of people just drunk small beer. Yeah. Um, and you could buy a pint of gin for a penny. Bargain. There were just gin shops on every corner. Not every corner, that's an exaggeration, but you could get <laughs> gin. You could get gin extremely easily in London in the late 18th century. Lots of it. Really dirty, cheap gin. What, a penny? Well, of course, a penny was worth more than it is today, a lot more, but nonetheless, a pint of gin for a penny. So everyone, certainly by the evening, <laughs> not everyone, but a lot of people were sort of drunk. Yes. A lot of the time. Yeah. Um, when you look at the rum rations for the Royal Navy, sort of crazy, really. Sort of, was everyone walking around a little bit drunk most of the time? I think maybe. Um, it just, yeah. Again, today, the 21st century, we're actually a lot more, you know, we, people aren't drunk all the time. No, we have grown up a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. Just a yeah. little bit. Yeah, more raucous times. Just yeah. much, much more raucous times. I, I think the cherry on the top to this story as well, though, is that when they... Um, sort of put it to Fox. Have you instigated this attack on Mr. Pitt? Um, Fox's alibi was, no, no, it wasn't me. I was in bed with my mistress. <laughs> <laughs> Just as the absolute, you know, chef's kiss to, to finish that, that story. And, and everyone was sort of like, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. You know. Oh, well, we can verify that. And it was the case. So, yeah. Um, yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> well, well done. Yeah, for not <laughs> yeah, instigating it, Mr. Fox. Uh, to watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.